So, uh, but thank you for doing this. And um, I just want to begin by asking you if you remember two moments. First of all, the first time you even tried acting, even if it was just for fun, you know, for what, what that might have involved. And then also if there was a moment after which you knew that you wanted to be or that you were, you know, an actor. I, uh, when I was living in, well, I'd, uh, when I was in Minnesota, um, I remember we only had three channels uh, out on the farm and, and but I noticed, cooler than mine. <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed on VHS that, that um, they had the address to these studios and they would put up addresses to the studios after the television shows and so I'd write letters asking them to put me in their movies. I think it was, I, I actually, no, first time I acted, that was <laughs> I'd done like a, a, a play in school for a canned food drive where I got to play a bully, sitting, you know, they had like a classroom set up with all these chairs, and I just got to wear a bandana and kick the chair in front of me and just, you know, <laughs> sort of annoy this, this poor girl. Um, um, the f uh, what was the second? Just if, then when you knew you wanted to do it for the long haul. But I guess it was, it was uh, <clears throat> after after reading the Glass Menagerie and uh, reading about Tom Wingfield and Laura Wingfield and the situation he was in, saying he was at the factory, sort of working, when all the while he was getting away from his mom and sister every day to watch movies and to get away from his own reality. And at this time, I was living in Arizona with my mother and sister constantly going to, I'd pay for one movie, go to two more after that, and I'd come home late, my mom would ask where I was, and I'd say I was at the movies, but she thought I was up to something debaucherous, you know, and she would never believe, so I'd have to start lying about little things, like, then I, and, and uh, so, so that was kind of it, so when I'd read Tennessee Williams, uh, you know, play, and then watched John Malkovich do it, I saw this kind of, this guy with this sort of desperation on outside, you know, uh, stairways smoking cigarettes and, and talking about his emotions and I, I really liked uh, that and felt I had something sort of at that age a little similar mm -hmm. within the situation I was in. Interesting. Well, maybe I can do it. You didn't have someone to talk to about his emotions since I had to become an actor. Right. <laughs> How about you? I, I grew up on a movie set. I was always like kicking around craft service, and you know my my parents' friends, like family friends, were always the directors of movies. And um, I uh, really always looked up to my parents and thought, like, you know, when they would come home from work and I'd smell their jeans, like you, you know, because at that point you're at that level, you're five years old, you like grab onto a thigh and you're like, wow, you smell like you've been so many places and like you know my mom's a script supervisor and so she's uh, you know it's a technical job but at the same time she's she's we've my whole family we've always like really had a huge appreciation of film from like a technical standpoint and then um, that's what started me I really wanted to do stuff I really wanted to be a part of it I wanted the adults to talk to me and um, then I turned like 13 I did a movie called Speak that um, like, it was super emotional for me and, and um, seemed to really affect people. It was a lifetime movie, literally, that, I mean, ultimately it was, it didn't start out that way. And, uh, it, like, there was this, there was this, um, date rape hotline, not to get too heavy here, that had an influx of callers that, like, suddenly I looked sort of over my shoulder after a, a PSA that I had done, mm -hmm. um, that played before the movie, and I was like, wow, this thing that got so completely in my own head has affected so many other people too, and I sort of realized, like, you know, um, after after an experience that was so uh, transformative, that it could help other people too. And that's not why I do it. It's definitely a personal thing, mm -hmm. but movies can be important. They don't have to be, but that was they a really confirmation can. for me on the second film that I did in Texas. We're working in Austin, Texas, on Friday Night Lights. And um, it was Peter Berg had known a lot of these players, uh, got to know a lot of these players from the actual team, and some of them had been, you know, badly injured to be paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And me and uh, or Billy Bob, Tim McGraw, and Derek Luke and I and Pete all went to 
the hospital to visit this kid, and uh, and uh, he'd seen Derek Luke as soon as he walked in the door because he'd seen uh, the film that Derek did with uh, Denzel Washington. Oh, sure, yeah. and he was just man, he was so moved, like he couldn't believe that he was <laughs> right in front of him and brought tears to his eyes, and you got to see how emotionally effective that it can be. And that's also when I realized that I, you know I want to do this for the rest of my life. Also, by the end of a movie, at that age too, you go like, oh God, I need to do this again. Yeah. It's literally, it's just an instinct. It's like, you get that dropped on ass feeling. Yeah. Like, okay, I'm not being used anymore. Can you use me again, please? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, flash, fast forwarding a little bit, I read that both of you guys were sort of cast in, or became attached on the road at a time that was sort of very different from you know, your careers were in a very different place than they are today, and I just wonder if you can take us back to when, what you were up to when Walter first brought this possibility to your attention, and then what it was um, that appealed to you about it. I know you both read it, but just why, so where you were and just what it meant to you, that possibility of being in this kind of a movie. And, um, from being such a fan of the book and looking up that Francis Ford Coppola was directing it, you know, ten years ago when I when I read it or around then, and uh, doesn't that sound crazy in your yeah, mouth? Yeah, <laughs> I said, uh, you know, there's no chance I'll ever be a part of this. But I was at high school in Arizona, so indeed, you know, why would that? Mm -hmm. And you know, later on, once I moved to LA and was able to start working a bit here and there, there was a uh, you know finally a script for it, and I got the script in fall of 2006 and finally met with Walter in the spring of 2007, but I went up to Minnesota with a one-way ticket because times were a little slow, and I was just going to help my dad out on the farm, and, uh, and as soon as I landed in, in Fargo, I got a call from the agent saying that Walter would like to see me on Wednesday, this being Sunday, so now I had to drive three hours to my town, have one day there, drive back, and then uh, within that time, I'd figured that maybe it'd be a good time to take my notepad and, and account for this story. And so the, the whole journey I'd had, driving around on the country roads with yeah. my good buddy that was very similar to the build of a, a Kerouac, he was a two-time state wrestling champion, and, and we're just sort of driving between all these, you know, sort of hay fields, cow pastures, highways, run-down towns, towns of population 10, towns of population 2,500, sort of talking <coughs> the whole time. And uh, went back to L.A. and just said, do you, after reading with him, do you mind if I read you this right? Wow. Wow. Amazing. And how about, this was pre-Twilight, wasn't it? I think so. I, I, I'm not sure if I met him right, uh, right before or right after I filmed it, actually. I think maybe right before, because I vaguely remember talking to him about Catherine Hardwick, um, in a great way, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, I I had I had read the book sort of before the period of time where you go, you know, can I break away? Where am I going? What are my ambitions? I think at that point I was kind of projecting into the future, going, so that's what lies ahead, and that's what I totally want to be like when I'm there. Mm -hmm. It's like at that point you look around um, and go, you can, you're not just around the people that you're around circumstantially. It's like, you know, you're around your family all the time, you go to school, those are your friends. Mm, you can go out and find the people that really fuel you and, and make you thrive and, and push yourself. And uh, I, I had fun reading it for the first time. I wasn't like hugely into, um, I was always good in school, but like kind of reluctantly. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I, I ripped through it. And then so when I met Walter for it, I, um, I can't even tell you what we talked about. It was just something, an energy passes between people when you know you love something for the same reasons. And uh, he told me that, that I could do it that day. And uh, just tr just tripped me out, man. I, I, I would have, especially considering I wouldn't really, at that point, I had played parts that were very similar to myself. Mm -hmm. I had really not begun to scratch the surface of, of discovery. Mm -hmm. I was. I was exploring things that were really apparent to me about myself, and in this case it was like, do I have this in me? <laughs> I didn't know that I did before, and then luckily I, I don't think I, you know, 
completely messed it up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it was fun. It was it was hard, but it was fun. I heard just one other follow-up with that was that uh, Walter had been had, had a couple of other friends in the film community who had seen Into the Wild, and that made sort of brought his attention to you before you impressed him enough himself. But like, is that true that you? Do you sort of there? It's an interesting. They would be a cool double header at the movies to see those two together. That's what I said as well. <laughs> after I'd seen it, I was like, Walter. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> uh, another just sort of interesting thing to me, just as an outsider looking at it, is that here you were when you were um, as you became a part of this film and, and it, the long development to, to come to reality. You guys were sort of for better or worse, losing your anonymity, while these guys who you're playing were essentially able to go around and be authentic, you know, complete, completely authentic life or whatever, you know, the, the uh, um, and I just wonder if, uh, was it hard, first of all, to, to experience that initial jarring effect during, of, of not having your life entirely be your own, but also then, um, you know, to, when you're playing these characters, does that seem sort of appealing to you personally, this idea that you can go out and do your own thing and not, nobody's gonna, you experience life as you, on your own terms? Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's definitely liberating. I mean, it's the same that was kind of the way that I was able to research for this role was to sort of take off and go on these drives. And at that point, I, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't getting recognized everywhere I was going, depending on, you know, if I went to the Midwest, it, it, Friday Night Lights, or if I went, you know, um, uh, definitely if I came to Toronto, they'd be like, ah, oh, four brothers. But <laughs> when, um, when, when rehearsing, or researching for the film, I would take off and go for drives and just kind of, you know, see where it took me and, and, and have fun and it sort of gave me a, a confidence of the road. And you know, to be able to sort of survive if you were to, you know, lose your material things, lose your phones, lose your wallets, lose this and that, and it gave you a sense of how to, uh, you know, how to survive. And just like within the book, where where Dean says, you know, I can go anywhere in America and get what I want because I know people, I know America, and I think uh, there was a great confidence going on to this with him being able to go to all these different places and travel and journey and be extremely, um, uh, you know, energized because uh, that's what some of this had given me. Uh -huh. um, for her, it was... was the, would you say there was a moment when you, when you knew that anonymity was going to be hard to come by anymore and then also the same thing about does this now sort of have an appeal, this idea of being able to just kind of go out and be unhassled? Um, I've always been really overtly sensitive about it before I'd even, I mean, I did a commercial and kids knew about it at school and I was like, ah! <laughs> so at that, at that point, I, like, I already felt like I had lost it at like 10, which is, you know, absurd and totally self-inflicted. But um, I, I, uh, I think maybe, I think it probably has a lot to do with why I was attracted to something like this. I, I mean, not, not fundamentally, but like a thing that made it desirable. Also, like, you know, uh, the, the character that I'm playing is, is, is doing things for the first time as well. And uh, I, 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 I got to sort of, I, I really did get to live sort of carefree for a bit. Not every second, obviously. There were a few times when I was like, I really hope we're not being photographed right now. <laughs> um, on set, like, the scene is just too... Um, yeah, whatever. Um, but but at the same time, with with these people, I uh, I was so able to let my face hang there, and that's the only way that I can describe it. And it's never been who I am, and um, and I know that that's in there somewhere. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's it's my biggest thing about acting is that you're not pretending to be someone else. You're just finding yourself. And um, yeah, it was it was fun. I think um, I took a I took a drive right before we did this movie. I got to Ohio, I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to make it all the way to New York, so I had to turn around and go back, but... From L.A., you went to Ohio? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, I, I, uh, drove most of the way. 
like it was so more about like who was in the car with me. It was kind of a shame I couldn't I couldn't it wasn't as sprawling as it could have been. Mm -hmm. It really could have been a, a bit a bit more freer. But I think that it's really important to recognize that um, and really important to recognize in myself that this thing actually has taken a lot of fear away. It's like don't be afraid of people, you know, even if you know you are it's that's that's what it is and, and, and you're never you know, acknowledge acknowledge your position in life, and don't try to have someone else's. And get however much you can out of that. And uh, yeah, I I think that people will be very impressed, but not surprised after they see the movie to know how much a preparation went into it, including what I have heard called beat boot camp. And I just wanted to ask you if there's any way to sort of I know it was a long process so but is there a way to sort of succinctly summarize what that involved and then on a related point just with that um, the it seems from from what I've read about that that it's a really it was a lot of learning a lot of creative stuff and it just begs the question as you know you guys are you got in well Chris I think you were at a much younger age got into this but Garrett when you started working you would have been probably about the time that most of your peers were starting college does that idea or the possibility of college even you know hold any allure to you yeah, well first off um, at the sort of uh, the beat boot camp mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, 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 it makes me sound like, it sounds like we're doing saving private Ryan or something with books but it's like but within this it was just a moment for us to um, for four weeks prior to starting filming to get in one apartment space that the production had rented, all of us every morning till night would arrive and and sort of just live and breathe it. And it was all the books that we'd acquired, ones that maybe we'd found that others hadn't seen, one that they discovered that maybe we hadn't seen, just share the material. Yeah. And we got to sit with biographers that were able to show us, you know, give us other material we hadn't had, plus um, offer us to listen to uh, tapes of Luann Henderson, her right. character, talking for hours and hours and hours. John Cassidy, Neil's son, came by and, wow. and hung with us. And me and Walter previously went to San Francisco and sat down with him uh, prior to this. And um, it was uh, it was just wonderful. And also to get together and to bond and to also start losing those inhibitions and fears within each other, to not be so self-conscious, but know that we all have each other's backs yeah. and, and it, be a scene dealing with you know, uh, anything that um, would remotely be embarrassing to, uh, well, relatively anyone to seek the, the slightest amount of comfort out of it. Um, in terms of being 18, when I'd started and kind of going through being in the similar age of these ones, I know that, uh, you know, uh, our, we're still growing so much, we don't know everything. And even though when we're 18, we think we know everything. And um, but for me, my first film took me to London, to Malta, to to Mexico, and to be with all those actors, kind of traveling around and Peter O'Toole's and stuff like that <laughs> gave such a. Uh, I, I wanted to go to college, but for journalism. But after I'd finished doing my first film with all these guys, I felt like I'd spent four years in college just from getting to see the world, mm -hmm. and that's what these guys were kind of striving towards was how can they expand their minds with self-development, self-discovery and, and you know, trying things here and there but within the result of that, within them going against the conservativeness and, and, and trying different things, be it the drugs or the jazz or the sex or just stepping out of what the norm was, they got to either you know, come out of this tornado unscathed or come out much wiser and they continue to grow and grow and then bless us with that knowledge for us to experience it on our own. And Kristen, same question for you. Um, I, I, I grew up always, like, never, I've never ever imagined that I wouldn't go to college. I just got caught up in things that were just as, you know, you know, I think what I knew when I was younger was that I wanted to be I wanted, I wanted to know that I was going to be really challenged, um, and I am, and I didn't want to step out of what was already really challenging me, and um, I definitely, I mean, like, just to specifically answer the question is, uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I, I, 
not, not very, I'm not a good planner, and I'm really not good at um, saying that I'm going to be somewhere. Particularly, like I, I think, I think it's much better for me to sort of seek things out myself, and I'm definitely doing that. This has given me, like, you know, I, I feel sort of the same way. This was like, this was like, this was a class. I have a friend the night. other day that said, "Let's spontaneously go to Las Vegas tomorrow at four. <laughs> and um, I guess, well, to that, uh, you know, to that same point, though. I mean, you know, people say that the thing. A lot of actors have said that the thing that enables them to be that, that was sort of inspired them to be an actor, helped them to be an actor early on, was the ability to sort of go out and observe people behaving naturally, not putting on airs or anything like that, and yet. The problem, the conundrum, is that when you do it well, the reward is that you, it makes it that much harder to then go out and do that in the future. Do you find that, is that true, first of all, that that is a help as an actor to be able to, to just see people behaving normally? And then what do you do when you can't do that anymore? That's why it was, uh, it was wonderful. You know, I had a, one of my best buddies through high school um, was the lead in every single play that our high school put on. There were big productions and, and uh, had read all of Shakespeare before 10th grade and I just kind of bowed behind that sort of uh, what he had accomplished when I hadn't even, you know, done any of that. And, uh, and I had sort of thought within myself that if I just read all the books that I can read and, and start broadening my sense of imagination I mean, uh, and plus, if I, if I was going off to college, I was just going to go for, for history, for journalism, to continue reading much more, to learn about historic facts and this and that, and people and places, rather than being forced how to act and the rules of acting down your throat. It's kind of like the Kerouac in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of if he was, you know, forced to write in a, in a, in a way of format rather than spontaneous prose, he wouldn't be as individual. and. Um, uh, I felt within this one that it was wonderful to sort of get on the road and, and meet people and you know, I drove, as soon as I was signed on, I drove to San Francisco and sort of grabbed a video camera and interviewed these bums on the street to find out kind of where they came from, how they got there. And you meet a man that took a train all the way from Maine, you know, got busted in each town for Bagger and see, but ate well the whole way. And a man that owned a cheese shop in Monterey. And a man that, you know, wore a black cowboy hat with a leather jacket and a glass eye who just got out of San Quentin, <laughs> who, you know, told me everything I could know about the city in the most glorious way in 40 minutes. And so it's, and it's not being, but I'm, I've never been, you know, I, I like doing that though. For me, it's, I'm not afraid to travel alone to sit. You know, at a bar alone or a place alone, talk to people and see what their stories were, and I think that helped tremendously in terms of you know stepping on for this film. And just to close, I wanted to ask Chris and answer the same. Just the ability to observe people in their natural habitat. I think it's. I think you've probably kind of lost your head a little bit if you think that uh, your effect on people is making them inhuman. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like it's, you're just looking through a slightly different scope, and it's a pretty. It's a pretty interesting one, I've got to tell you. <laughs> and it, 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 like, yeah, um, so no, no, it hasn't, if anything, it's just, it's a little altered, but it's almost more, people really, I think I'm going to stop. No. Uh, well, it just really, it really, it really intensifies, or really um, increases your intuition, your uh, instincts about a person before having to, you know, and speak to them one after a while. Which sounds like it's guarded. It sounds like that's sort of like... Uh, so we're from 20 feet away, you already know a person. Well, uh, yeah, it's a know, one, if it's one person, one side would have sort of an advantage in the conversation there if they know the, the what they think they know, the yeah. other side. But anyway, I don't want to... This could go on all day. <laughs> <laughs> but, as long as you just don't let it lock you up, that's yeah. the thing, and that's, you know, it can be like a bit... I don't want to say the word struggle, it sounds awful. No, it's, like, it's, yeah, it's like being... It's starting to become... I say that sometimes the curse is the curse of experience. Somebody, you know, uh, maybe, you know, somebody can think that they've lived enough and met all the people around that they start to shut people off mm -hmm. because they've, oh, I know what this is going to be, but, right. you know, You've you, never you, seen you can it always before, be surprised. 
Well, thank you guys so much, and congratulations on the move. Appreciate it very much.